Chapter 30 Jaden Kensington A weight lifts off my shoulders the moment I'm alone, the moment the door shuts. I don't have to put on a show in here. I don't have to hide the seeds I grabbed from Sal behind Jacob's back, while feigning going for a walk. Yet I do still have to hide them another way. I pull out the backpack I tucked under the bed. Unclipping the top and pulling open the string tie opens the bag enough for me to put the seeds inside. I close it up and shove it back under the bed. I don't want to have the bag exposed for too long. Jacob has a habit of walking in without knocking. I can organize it better tonight. The seeds as a brick pack should go to the bottom of the bag. The water and food I stole last night can go on top, and my change of clothes can settle in the middle. I'll look for medicine tonight. Maybe some camping gear for Plan C, I still haven't figured out where they would have extra vehicles or vehicle gas. It's been long enough that the sitting vehicles might not have working parts anymore, or the gas degraded too much. They don't seem to have much for vehicles here in the first place. I didn't see anyone using any vehicles on my tours. But I suppose when you have everything you need, then you don't have to make regular trips out to other places. And they do seem like they have everything they need. Everything seems ideal here for survival and living. On the surface, it would be a perfect place to live. If Jacob wasn't here, if there wasn't the threat of death, then this could be a great place. Plenty of food, power, water and mild winters. But looking deeper there are cracks and sinkholes. It's only a matter of time before something happens. At least the others got out before anything happened to them. All the main storehouses are in this house. Of course they are. That gives him all the control of their supply. But convenient. Because, I was able to sneak downstairs and grab some things last night. Got ice cream all by myself too. I miss the moment that Dominique will never get to experience. It didn't really happen. I pull out my phone and check it. I have a message. I pull open the messages to find a couple texts from John. I read through his new message, then back to last night's messages three times to let it all sink in and figure out how best to manage my immediate problem, Dominique. John says Dominique isn't accepting my saying to stay where she is. I get it, with all that seems to be going on but there's no point in putting them in extra danger, and we don't know for certain what's going to happen yet. Maybe if I text with Dominique, it might help reassure her. I text him. If I could message her directly, it might help better than John relaying the information back and forth. I wait staring at the phone, glancing up at the door briefly. I don't have much time. I hope he responds quickly or this'll have to wait. Just as I go to put my phone back in my pocket, a notification pulls up. I'll go get her. That's good. Maybe I can get this done soon. I move into the bathroom and lock the door. It's about the only place I could get reasonable privacy for an unsuspicious amount of time. I start typing out a longer message for when she texts me. I know she's going to ask me how I am or how things are going. How are you? Dominique's message comes through. I quickly wrap up my message to her and send it over. Things are good. John told me about your plan. Please wait. Sal got me seeds. Waiting on the trees to be cut and put in rooting hormone. Trying to figure out a good way to transport them. I guess after the rooting hormone the trees should be planted within two hours. Still looking for a good way to transport them. Can you make sure a spot is prepped and holes ready to plant? I should be home tomorrow or the next day. No point in coming. I reread the message after having been sent. I don't know if I should add more or clarify anything. Maybe I should reassure her more that I'm fine. Or would it be too much and suspicious? Are you sure? Yes? Okay, did John tell you James moved your stuff to the farm? We all moved to a couple of houses across the road. So go to the farm with the trees and stay there. We'll show you your house. Sounds good? I send back in response. I don't think she snuck a look at the previous messages. John's updated me on a few things. More things than I suspected would have happened since yesterday morning. 
I miss you. Dominique says. My chest flips. I didn't realize she would miss me. I type back. I miss you too. Her next message comes through as soon as I hit send. I love you. Forever and always. A smile bursts onto my face, the heat grows in my chest to unbearable levels, and a tear falls down each cheek. Three quick moments in quick succession of whiplash emotions. She loves me. Why? I wonder if she means it, or if she's just saying it situationally. I love you too. I respond in kind. She's my family, of course I love her but I didn't expect that she would feel that way towards me. That seems to be the ending to the conversation, so I put my phone away, flush the toilet and run the sink for a moment before leaving the bathroom. The alibi misdirect saves me. Anna waits for me in my room. I hadn't heard her enter. Hi, I say politely. Your dad said to meet him on the driveway. There's another leader coming here, Mr. Smith. And he wants you to be there to greet him. Anna announces then leaves an abrupt end to the conversation. I know Jacob has likely already been waiting longer than he would tolerate. I don't know how long Anna was in my room before I left the bathroom, but Jacob would expect an immediate arrival. Promptly after being told, by a woman who would have rushed to tell me. I hesitate when I think about all the nitpicks Jacob made comments about this morning. Your nails are long. As he stared at my hands. I'm going to have to hide the ice cream from you, if I want to be able to eat any myself. After he found out I ate one small bowl of ice cream, then proceeded to take the ice cream tub to his room. You don't need any more of that anyway. I'm doing you a favor. Your hair is shiny. As his lip twitched. I see you haven't lost your love of eating food in all this. As he looked down at my stomach with a frown. You should take advantage of having a shower as much as you can. How about you have another shower today? Right after he audibly sniffed the air around me. I wonder if the women around here have that hair removal cream. None of them have hairy faces. As he stared at my lower face. You'll have to get used to being quiet again. I can tell you aren't used to being quiet anymore. Must have something to do with the group you were with. They were quite chatty, weren't they? We're quiet around here. We're not used to someone being so loud. He commented, after I had a small good morning pleasantries conversation with Anna. But, I don't have time to change any of them. I'll risk more comments and tell him I plan on fixing them later. Otherwise, maybe he'll make a comment about how he was just joking. And then I don't have to change anything. It would be more of an issue to be late which I fear I already am. Nothing more rude of a person to do than to waste someone else's time by being late. Swiftly I make my way out of the house. Jacob stands in the middle of the two closed garage doors. He looks me up and down. His nose flares. He's upset with how I look. You could have made yourself more presentable. He snips. Put on a dress at the least. Sorry. I got here as quick as I was told. I apologize. Stand next to me. We don't have time to get you changed. He looks over toward the driveway entrance, so I do too. A black limo is pulling up. I stand beside him. You're to make a good impression. I won't have you insulting our guest for any reason. It's important you behave yourself and don't cause any problems whatsoever. You are a Kensington and you will act like one. Jacob warns me quietly with a smile. The driver gets out of the vehicle. They are possibly in hearing vicinity, so I know not to say anything incriminating about what was just said to me. Understood, I say vaguely and quietly. Posture check. Smile check. Hands at my side check. Mr. Smith is led out of the vehicle by the driver. He makes his way over to us. Mr. Smith is a short and stout older man, with white hairs taking over from his natural black ones. He's dressed up in a business casual staple, of a long-sleeved blue sweater over top of a blue dress shirt. His khaki pants are very bright and out of place. He greets Jacob with a firm handshake. Nice to see you again. 
and this must be your daughter, Jaden. Mr. Smith looks me up and down. I put out my hand to shake his. Nice to meet you. Is that any way to greet your uncle? Mr. Smith pushes my hand to the side and wraps his arms around me for a hug. He squishes tight. I put my hands on the back of his sides awkwardly. My have you grown into a lovely young woman. I don't remember him. Why does he say he's my uncle? Jacob doesn't have any brothers, does he? He's never mentioned any. Wouldn't they have the same last name? I need to push him away, but that would be rude. His touch itches away at my senses. Mr. Smith kisses my cheek before pulling away. I keep my smile unwavering but the kiss burns at my skin, even more so, the saliva he left behind. I push down a shudder. You don't remember me, do you? He questions me. No, sorry. I apologize. I wish I knew, because I know I'm being quite rude right now. Hopefully he doesn't take offense, or Jacob will be mad at me. He waves off my apology. It's been years since we saw each other last, so I don't blame you. I look over to Jacob for silent help. Between the two of them, I expect some sort of explanation to appear, but it seems like it would be rude to ask. I brought you a trinket. Mr. Smith tells me. His driver brings over a small black box and hands it to me before he goes back to the car. I open the box at Mr. Smith and Jacob's silent insistence. The black velvet box contains a pink water drop shaped gemstone encased in silver and clear gemstones. I was told pink is your favorite color. It's a pear shaped pink diamond encrusted in diamonds and white gold. Mr. Smith explains. Pink isn't my favorite color. I don't have a favorite color, that custom never made sense to me. But it seems like a color Jacob would say is my favorite. Thank you so much. You didn't have to get me this, but I appreciate it. I look to Jacob for approval on my response. His face doesn't give anything away. This seemed like a moment where I have to accept the gift immediately and humbly. His mile-long stare has me questioning if I should have rejected the gift first, so that Mr. Smith could insist that I have it, and then I could accept it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Put it on. Let's see it. Mr. Smith insists. I fumble the packaging, trying to get the necklace out. Mr. Smith takes the necklace from me and instructs me to turn around so he can put it on me. He pulls off my other necklace, the one the Khadiza Alpha gave me. I grab it back in a quick motion, worried he might toss it away. I wrap it around my wrist to make a bracelet, as well as I can. It's loose but it'll work for now. I spin back around when he lets go and backs away. Mr. Smith stares at my chest for a moment in approval. His gaze lingers too long. Now, Mr. Smith claps his hands together, I was promised the best meal I've had in a long while. You know I like to be wined and dined before talking business. Yes, we'll get to that right away. Anna has been preparing for it all day. You won't be disappointed. Jacob assures him. I better not be. Mr. Smith huffs out a laugh. He pats Jacob on the upper arm. Then let's go eat. Jacob waves his arm towards the front door. Mr. Smith and Jacob go side by side in front of me to the dining room. They catch up talking about Mr. Smith's trip. Though I would hardly call a short drive a trip. Unless I'm misunderstanding, he's just a bit south along the lake. Jacob sent a messenger on foot to invite him out before supper last night, and he was back before the end of the night. Mr. Smith pulls out a chair and looks expectantly at me. He shows me the palm of his hand as he gestures towards the seat. Thank you. I pull my smile wider for a moment, then take the seat. He takes the seat across from me while Jacob sits at the head of the table, his spot in reach to my right and Mr. Smith's left. Jacob faces to look out the windows. So you're what 18 now? Graduated high school? Jacob asks me. I try not to be insulted but I'm certain he doesn't even know when my birthday is. The only reason it was remembered last year was because of Kendra. I haven't thought of her in so long. I wonder what happened to her and my brother. Would Jacob be furious if I asked him where she is or what happened to her? 
Would he even know? I always had the sense that she might have left him, right before this all happened. Would he want to talk about the woman who disappeared with his beloved male heir? I answer quickly. No, I'm 15 and I was set to graduate next year. Though, I would have had enough credits to technically graduate after the first semester. You'll have to forgive your dad. You're so mature that you make him forget your real age. Mr. Smith waggles his eyebrows. It's been a hard year. Must have made me think we were separated for longer than that. Jacob excuses. About five months, I tell him. Only that long? It's felt like longer. Jacob says. Anna interrupts thick silence with the first serving of food, herbed breadsticks. She swiftly brings salmon covered in yellow sauce, mashed potatoes, and assorted vegetables. I'm given a cup of bubbly brown liquid, while they get more red wine. Jacob tells Anna, fill them up. She fills them almost to the top of the glasses, emptying the bottle between two glasses. It looks delicious. Almost competes for the top view of the night. Mr. Smith compliments, before digging into the salmon with his fork. I take his first bite as sign that I can start eating too. Jacob shovels his first mouthful in once he's done draining half his glass. The food is delicious. It's been so long since I've had fish. The butter-based sauce is a surprise burst of flavor. I haven't seen any cows around here. I guess I should have had this query when I had the ice cream. Where are they getting the dairy products? Is that how Mr. Smith ties in? Maybe he's got cows where he lives, and there is a trade system between the two groups. Something itches in my brain and tunes me into the conversation the two old men are having. She's grown up since the days she would sit on your lap. Jacob finishes. I'm sure she's not so grown that she couldn't still sit on my lap. Mr. Smith says. It certainly made those dry meetings more tolerable. I continue to eat my food and look down at my plate. I gather together that they knew each other from before. Jacob and Mr. Smith used to have business meetings, and I guess I used to join and sit on Mr. Smith's lap. I don't quite remember that. But I do know that I used to sit in on meetings when I would be at the office. The other men he would be meeting were usually nice, and I would sit with them while coloring. You know Jaden, if you ever get bored of this place you are welcome to stay at my place. It would be nice to have a young woman around the house again. How about you come out in a week or two and stay for a bit? Mr. Smith offers. Oh, thank you, but I don't know how long I'm staying. Mr. Smith shoots a look to Jacob, who is staring through me. I shouldn't have said that. I have to clarify what I mean in an acceptable way. I made a promise to my friends that I would get them seeds and trees. I need to go back to get them those. Not sure when though. Anna clears away the dinner plates, then comes back with three slices of black forest cake, Jacob's favorite. I take spoonful after spoonful of the luscious dessert into my mouth, it may be my favorite too after not having it for so long. My back teeth hit something long and gritty. The long hair bundled in the last spoonful. I bite my lips closed and gag. My eyes water. I panic. Don't cause a scene. Don't be disrespectful. Don't be rude. I can't spit it out. That would ruin the entire dinner. Jacob would be furious with me. I don't want to face the wrath that would come from embarrassing him like that, insulting Anna's cooking like that. I gag again. Next time I'm bound to throw up. I bound up the hair in the cake with my tongue and swallow it down. My stomach heaves. I wash down the, my throat lurches with pop finishing the whole rest of my glass in a few gulps. I look to Jacob and Mr. Smith. Both appear to have completely missed the moment, that's good. It wasn't for nothing. I haven't disrespected our guest. I haven't embarrassed Jacob. I haven't insulted Anna's cooking, she's busy in the pantry and didn't see. The rest of the cake might as well be mud now, for my lack of wanting to eat it. Would it be insulting to not finish the cake? It's one of the things that Anna worked hard and long on for, and Jacob always warns against wasting food. We have a guest. If there's another, I gag once more at the thought, hair, then I'll stop and claim I'm full. 
I carefully dig more scoops of cake into my mouth. They are thin slices, unable to hide anything. I finish the rest of the cake without incident, however my stomach is queasy and my throat is tight. Each bite is forced down. Well that was delicious. I couldn't possibly eat another bite. Well done. Mr. Smith leans back and sinks down a bit in his chair. Anna is the best chef we've got. Jacob compliments. Yeah, it was delicious. I compliment at risk of silence being rude and insulting. Well, I better get Jaden off to do something else so we can discuss business. If you'll excuse me for a moment. Jacob rises up from his chair, and I promptly follow when it sinks in that he's trying to dismiss me. Any excuse to not have to socialize anymore. Of course. It was lovely seeing you again, Jaden. I hope to see you again before you head off to bed. Mr. Smith smiles largely. I might turn in early, I'm afraid. I've had a few exhausting days. I try to excuse politely. Of course. Your dad mentioned you had just arrived. It must have been exhausting trying to survive out there. So in that case sweet dreams. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Mr. Smith says. Thank you. Have a great night. I say. Jacob waits impatiently for me to leave. We walk out of the dining room area and up the stairs. He puts a hand around my arm as I try to reach the last step. You don't want to stay with your poor old dad. He grates quietly. I play dumb. I know he's talking about me mentioning bringing seeds back to Red Deer. I match his level so Mr. Smith doesn't understand if he can hear us. I'm just going to bed. You said you had business to talk about. You're planning on leaving back to Red Deer. He accuses quietly. Just to get them the seeds and trees. I haven't made a decision yet about where I want to stay yet. I try to ease the incoming argument. You'll stay with me. You'll like it better here. He comes in closer and points his finger at me. Don't worry, I still have a few surprises that'll convince you to stay. Like what? I ask. Not yet. He shakes his head and smiles. Okay. He doesn't continue, so I bid him good night. Good night. Good luck with the meeting. I start to walk away and up the last stair. He grabs my arm and pulls me back into a crushing hug. You've gotten quite the attitude on you from staying with those people. This isn't how you should behave. Your mother is rolling around in her grave. Jacob whispers. I try to pull away, but he won't let me. Maybe your professional discretions will make up for what you lack in the wife department. You got to have something worth all this trouble you cause me. Jacob lets go. His eyes are wide and wild before he fixes his face and goes back down to the table with Mr. Smith. I walk the last bit slower than I would have liked, but fleeing won't do me any good. It would look suspicious and draw attention to me. I don't want to draw attention to myself. My heart panics relentlessly long after I'm safe in my room, showered and ready for bed. I turn off the lights and go over to the window. Pulling it over, I open up the window fully. The cool air refreshes the skin on my face. I close my eyes and focus on breathing in and out. Clearing my mind as much as I can. Trying to calm my stomach and fix the growing pain in my head. This one's targeting two spots on the back and front of my head. Tension migraines, you get stressed then you get a migraine, stop being stressed and the migraine goes away. Not immediately, but eventually. I kick the thoughts out of my head again. Nothing think nothing. The biggest breath of air goes into my lungs, then out. And again, and again. Once I've decided I've had enough, I close the window to a centimeter space and go crawl into bed. If Jacob and Mr. Smith are still going at it, they give no indication. I haven't heard a peep out of them. All that tells me is that it wasn't one of those boisterous jovial kinds of meetings. I wonder what they are discussing down there, and what matters of business and trade could be going on. I bring my hand up to my forehead. I imagine the cold seeping in and soothing my headache. It doesn't work. I huff out a puff of air. I know sleep won't come easy. 
Pulling the corner of the blanket to cover my eyes, I tuck it in on either side of my head. I roll a bit over and tuck the blanket underneath on that side, the repeat with my otherwise. I raise my feet up and capture the blankets beneath them. Once cocooned in, I pull both my arms up around my head and settle them on the pillow. Maybe this'll work. Sometimes it helps. I wait and wait for sleep to sink in as my brain swirls in thoughts and feelings that I can't control. The day's events slam into my forethoughts frequently. As the pain blends into the background, ever persistent yet more tolerable as the time passes. The painful grip on my arm releases with a sharp push. My legs stumble as they fail to catch up with the sudden lunge of my body. My arms swing forward just in time to soften the blow of the ground. Pain takes a back seat as I push it away to spring up and spin around. The door slams shut. I try to door knob, but hit the locking mechanism. Guess we die together. A voice floats through the darkness. No. I deny. There has to be some way out of this. I put my ear up to the door. Muffled cries and shouts drown out anything useful. I can't tell if they're gone, if they are still separating people and loading them up into different rooms. The screams and cries increase exponentially. A glistening light creeps in from the space under the door. The door warms. Fire. My mind answers my unasked question. I'll hug you if you want. She offers. I'm still trying to get out of here. The door might not be a good idea. The fire is right on the other side, but maybe a room beside us isn't lit up yet. In theory, it's possible. I knock on the walls to hear the hollow space behind them. It all sounds the same to me, so I take the chance. Summoning the hardest kick I can, my foot goes through two sets of drywall. My ankle scrapes against the sides as my leg gets stuck. I know in theory this is what I wanted, but there is still a dash of surprise that it actually worked. I pull my foot out of the hole. People huddle in the bedroom on the other side, staring back at me. I back away and kick at the wall again and again and again.